Chapter 11 is known as Vishwa Rupa Darshan Yoga. For all of you, Vishwa Rupa means the cosmic form, the cosmic self, the cosmic form, which is essentially the formless self. And Darshan is a direct insight or direct sight it comes from darshan to see so in this chapter we begin to understand what is this cosmic form this universal form of the divine through direct experience this is not intellectual this is not Something which is, you know, um, explained in any book, really anywhere. It is an attempt to describe that which is indescribable. A lot of people think that the Bhagavad Gita is purely a bhakti text. They think of it as a text about the deity Krishna, in reality, it is a yogic manual explaining the theory behind yoga, the practice of yoga, the different parts of yoga, and it covers essentially all the parts Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga and it covers Kundalini as well. So those who believe that this is only a text which is limited to Bhakti, it could not be further away from the truth. The last chapter as well as this chapter are about the Kundalini aspect. In the last verse of the last chapter, we left off by essentially talking about the example of electricity. And we said, all these are manifestations around us. So, how do these gadgets work? You use laptops, you use television sets, you use gadgets in your kitchen. All these different gadgets that we use, they function because of the power behind them. And the power behind it is electricity. So this was leading a big hint to Kundalini Yoga, the energy which is behind all these manifestations. In this chapter, Vishwa Rupa Darshan Yoga, we get to experience the electricity behind all these objects. We get to experience the actual energy itself, which makes all these manifestations that which they are. Without this energy, this would be purely dead matter and nothing more than that. So in the first verses, Arjuna says, Through the words of the supreme secret called spiritual knowledge, which you have taught out of your grace and kindness to me, Thereby this delusion of mine has vanished. I have heard from you in detail of the creation and dissolution of beings as well as your imperishable greatness. O oh, you having eyes like lotus petals. As you have spoken of yourself thus, O oh, Supreme Sovereign, I wish to see your lordly form. O unexcelled spirit, 
If you believe that it can be seen by me, O Lord, then show me your immutable self, O Lord of Yoga. These verses, Arjuna starts by referring to the secret. Guya, Guya means secret. And through this teachings, these secret teachings that we have all heard, his delusions have vanished. But he wants to see his lordly form, his cosmic form. It's like saying, yes, I have experienced many different parts of yoga. I have done some karma yoga. I have understood the theory of Sankhya behind this. I have understood the need for meditation, Raj, Raja Yoga. I have understood the techniques. All my delusions have vanished. I have full faith in the divinity. But I don't have a glimpse of it. I have not seen it for myself. I wish to see it, to behold it. Do you think I am strong enough? A good student, a student with humility, approaches his teacher and says, Oh, I have been a good student. I have paid attention. I have understood all these things. But I do not have any direct experience. So, in these first four verses of chapter 11, Arjun humbly asks Shri Krishna to show him the cosmic form. So, are there any questions so far? I think these verses are relatively speaking clear. It is Arjuna expressing his gratitude for what he has learned so far and requesting from Sri Krishna a direct experience of divinity. Isn't that what we all want? We all want to have a direct experience. Are you satisfied with intellectual knowledge? Are you satisfied with learning theories? I don't think so. Theories can maybe comfort us to a certain extent. But a good student is not satisfied with mere theories. A good student wants to have the direct experience itself. <clears throat> so what does the Blessed Lord say? Shri Krishna says, See my multifarious divine forms of many use and configurations by hundreds and by thousands. See the Adityas, Vasus, Rudras, Ashwins, as well as Maruts. See many wonders that have not been seen before, O descendant of Bharata. Today, see the entire world with everything, animate and inanimate, here dwelling in one, in my body, O master of sleep and whatever else you wish to see. However, you cannot see me merely with this eye of, my, of your own. I give you a divine eye. See my lordly yoga. So Sri Krishna blesses him with his blessings. He can see the divine form, the cosmic form. 
He sees in all colors, all shapes, all sizes, all the different beings. All these different beings that have been mentioned. We don't need to know all the details of their names. Suffice to say, these are different celestial beings. We have mentioned earlier that there are different lokas, different planes of consciousness and different beings, disembodied beings reside in these different planes of consciousness depending on their nature. So, getting this insight, this special sight, it is possible for Arjun to see all these different worlds, can see all things animate as well as inanimate. But, Sri Krishna explains, you cannot see it with your own eyes, these eyes that you have. You need divine eyes. These are known as Divya Chakshu. Divya is divine, Chakshu is eyes. Divya Chakshu is another way of saying that all the blockages that prevent you from seeing normally are removed. This is another way of saying Shri Krishna gave Arjuna Shaktipat. All of you have heard the word Shaktipat. You may not know exactly what it is. In Shaktipat, a teacher, through a touch, through a gaze, through a glance, can remove temporarily all obstacles so that the student can have a glimpse of the highest state of consciousness. This is meant to motivate the student, to encourage the student, to remove doubts if there are any. This Shakti part is reserved only for the highest students, the best of students, known as Adhikaris. It is not possible to give Shakti part to masses. There are many people who claim to give Shakti part to crowds, you know, entire <laughs> crowds they claim, oh, we give you Shakti part. Or there are teachers who claim to work on the granthis of the students and to remove their obstacles. If it were possible to do this at a mass level, why would a compassionate teacher withhold that from all of humanity, then it would be quite simple to liberate all of humanity, would it be not? Yes. However, it is not possible. The law of karma is brutal and merciless in that way. It is the final law and it cannot be merely disregarded and superseded. A teacher would use his own good 
karma to raise the level of consciousness of a good deserving student so that such a student can momentarily experience removal of obstacles and see the divine. This would have the effect of strengthening the student's sankalp shakti, of removing doubts, of providing him with greater energy which would be then integrated and would be possible only with such a student who is who's almost ready, who is prepared. It cannot be done with one who is not prepared. Therefore, Sri Krishna agrees to give Arjuna, who is an Adhikari, a very fine student, these divine eyes through Shakti Bhat, so that he can experience all the different levels of consciousness, get an overview, get an understanding which would deepen his practice eventually. Having seen once the truth with his own eyes or with divine eyes. Any thoughts so far? Any questions? Any doubts? Yes, Gautam. Uh, just a thought or a, a observation. Uh, I think the word temporary, which you mentioned, was uh, was my key takeaway uh, with the word definition. Because so far, whatever I've heard of Shakti Bhatt, the fact that it is temporary is, is you know doesn't come out because I think eventually after the Shakti part, uh, it is up to the student to uh, remove the blockages. Uh, and uh, achieve towards the uh, towards the oneness. Mm -hmm. So the shakti part is only a temporary thing for the moment. Uh, otherwise, uh, the shakti part is often taken as as something that a state of achievement has been done. Mm. And very often, at least personally, I know of people even after having a shakti part fall down into uh, into the state because uh, because of the fact that maybe a ego has taken over that yes, I have had the shakti part initiation. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, for me, the, the fact that it is temporary is, is so very important, which you very rightly uh, mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's only something as to, uh, to encourage the student to, uh, to deepen the practice further. Yes. And it's not an end by itself. Yes, indeed. It's not an end by itself. Well, if it were the end by itself, then, uh, you know, it would be very easy. Let, let the teacher give me Shakti part and then I don't need to do anything, you know. And that would be against the law of karma. That cannot be. It's like uh, the example that I often use. You have uh, taken a loan from a bank. You have to repay your loan. The question is, how do you repay your loan? You know, you can do it in smaller installments, take a longer period of time, or you can intensify the payments by paying larger amounts and finish it off, you know, finish off uh, paying your loans. So it is speeding up the process through intense practice. And the purpose of a Shakti part would be to help a student who is already in a very, very intense path and he requires maybe just a little glimpse to strengthen him further, to give him more confidence, to give him more sankalpa and so that would be the 
purpose, to remove obstacles in that sense. It does not mean remove obstacles in the sense that, oh, I don't need to do anything anymore. You know, I got Chakti Pad and now I can relax. So, yes, it is temporary. As you will see for yourself that um, Shri Krishna then says, okay, fine, I go back <laughs> to my original form now and uh, everything is back to normal. I think the only flip side to this, uh, I don't know, I could be wrong, is that after the Shakti part, a student feels, uh, because it is a teacher which has given the Shakti part, uh, mm -hmm. the teacher is identified as uh, as the ultimate one consciousness. And there's a, a higher cult following or, or thinking that the teacher is, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, cults being formed because of uh, because of this approach, that because, because of that... Uh, a uh, slight glimpse and then you take uh, the teacher to be the only one who can do this or uh, the ultimate. Mm. Yes, okay. Um, uh, Kalpna just wrote to me that she's having problems with connectivity. Uh, Joachim, could you, could you please um, just check yeah. if you can help <clears throat> her out? I will communicate. Yeah, yeah? okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, hello Manisha, that was nice. Uh, I did notice that you joined, yes. <laughs> nice that you're here. Alright, so that was Divya Chakshu Shakti Pad, and we continue with the verses. As I mentioned briefly before we started, and some of you were still not um, online, that chapter 11, Vishwa Rupa Darshan Yoga, the yogic vision, the cosmic form of Krishna uh, is seen and uh, this chapter is in fact about Kundalini Yoga. So verses 9 to 14. <clears throat> now Sanjay, who is the narrator, says, Having stated thus, O King, <coughs> Krishna, the sovereign of great yoga. Today we seem to have some disturbance. Is it... Um... Is everybody getting this, this disturbance? <laughs> oh dear. I don't know what that was. Okay, it's, it's gone now. Sanjay said, Having stated thus, O King, Krishna, the sovereign of great yoga, showed to the son of Pritha, his supreme lordly form, having many faces and eyes, with many wondrous views, wearing many divine ornaments, bearing many divine weapons held ready, wearing divine garlands and vestments, anointed with divine perfumes, comprising all wonders, the endless God facing in all directions. If there were to rise the brilliance of a thousand suns in heaven, that would be similar to the brilliance of that great souled one. Then the Pandava saw there in the body of the God of Gods, the entire universe, divided multifariously, dwelling in one. Then, possessed by amazement, that Dhananjay with his hair standing on end, with his hands clasped and bowing with his head addressed God. In this verses, especially one verse comes out very strong and that is the brilliance of a thousand suns. It has been described again and again 
the self experienced in yoga comes across as the brilliance of a thousand suns surya sahasra sahasrasya the brilliance of a thousand suns how can we experience that when we said in the earlier chapter the self chooses the self this can happen only with grace if you do your 50% doing regular practice systematic practice then it is possible to get this grace many of us have not experienced this grace and we wonder how is it what does it seem like and many of these texts have described these amazing moments of grace in different ways these descriptions such as the brilliance of a thousand suns give us a clue as to how it is to attain that highest since i mentioned right in the beginning that this chapter is about kundalini it is basically experiencing sorry basically describing the kundalini experience when the kundalini rises there is the union of shakti and shiva and then this is experienced as this amazing brilliance light of a thousand suns there are extremely um large numbers of teachers nowadays throughout the world who claim to be teaching kundalini yoga what they basically do is do some pranayama practices or ask you to meditate on a certain chakra and they call that kundalini nothing can be further from the truth you do not start with kundalini yoga you begin exactly like krishna begins with arjun by understanding the basic theory the samkhya the philosophy then by learning what karma means and how to integrate these into one's life to go further and practice meditation attain deeper insights allow these to be integrated experience one point of devotion this power and only then when all these have been integrated can one really come to that path which is known as kundalini so we cannot start with kundalini even though that seems to be somehow a very popular idea these days so some of these people they skip over everything and they just think that by meditating on some lower chakra they are going to attain something but skipping over basics <coughs> cannot lead to the raising of kundalini any questions or comments about this
Okay, in that case, we continue. We come to a slightly longer group of verses. These are verses 15 to 31. Before I start reading these verses, I just want to uh, mention briefly to those of you who came in late, who joined in late, that this is our last session this year. Some of you are aware that we are taking a slightly longer break this year, a winter break, uh, in order for me to be able to complete the book, Mastering Pranayam, which needs to go off for publication. And um, I can work on that book with a little bit more one-pointed attention uh, if I take a break from the Bhagavad Gita sessions. So our next session will be on the 27th of January next year. For those of you who might just sleep early, I would also wish you a very happy new year and uh, hope to see you all then in the last two week of January. Okay. All right, so verses 15 to 31. Arjuna said, O oh God, I see in your body all the gods, as well as groups of differentiated beings, Brahma, the Lord, sitting on the lotus seat, all the seers, as well as celestial serpents. I see you having many arms, bellies, faces, eyes with unending forms in all directions. O sovereign of the universe, bearing universal forms, I see not your end, nor the middle, nor again your beginning. I see you wearing a crown, a mace, a discus. You are a heap of light, effulgent in all directions, very difficult to look at, immeasurable, and all around brilliant like a blazing fire and the sun. You are the indestructible syllable, the supreme object of knowledge. You are the transcendental repository of this universe. You are the immutable one, the guardian of eternal law. I believe you to be the eternal spirit. I see you without beginning, end or middle or end, of unending virility with endless arms, with the moon and the sun for your eyes, your face like a blazing fire that receives oblation offerings, scorching this universe with your effulgence. This interval between heaven and earth is indeed pervaded by you alone, and so are all the points of the compass. Seeing this fearsome, wondrous form all the three worlds are disquieted, O great-souled one. These groups of guards are entering you, some of them feared, singing praises to you with hands clasped. The groups of great sages and adepts sing, May it fare well, praise you with ample hymns. Rudras, Adityas, Vasus, Sadhyas, Vishvadevas, Ashwins, Maruts, Ushmapas, Gandharvas, Yakshas, Asuras and Siddhas in many groups look at you and are all amazed. Your great form with many faces and eyes, O mighty armed one, with many arms, thighs and feet, with many bellies, terrible with many jaws, seeing it, all the worlds are troubled with fear, and so am I. Touching the sky, blazing with many hues, with mouth wide open, with huge burning eyes, seeing you, 
with my inner self, trembling in fear, I do not find consolation or peace, O Vishnu. Seeing your mouths terrible with jaws that appear like the fire of time, I lose the sense of direction and find no solace. Be pleased, O Lord of Gods, the dwelling place of the universe. These sons of Dhritarashtra, together with all the groups of kings, Bhishma, Drona and Sutta's son Karma, together with our own chief warriors, they hasten and enter your mouths, which are fearsome and awful with jaws. Some, stuck in the indecisis of your teeth, are seen with their heads crushed to powder. As the many flows of the waters of rivers run only toward the ocean, so the brave warriors of the human world, burning on all the sides, are entering your mouths. As moths with increasing speed enter the blazing fire for their destruction, similarly the worlds with increasing speed also enter your mouths towards their destruction. With flaming tongues you are swallowing from all sides all the worlds with burning mouths. Filling the entire world with effulgences, your terrible lights are scorching it, O Vishnu. Do tell me, who are you of fearsome form? Salutations to you, O best of gods. Do be pleased. I wish to know you, the first one. I do not know your movement at all. Awesome verses. Verses 15 to 31. You may have noticed that the experience did not seem actually very pleasant at all. It has been described as, as fearsome. There's fires of destruction, terrible lights, burning on all sides, death, terrible jaws, It seems that <coughs> it's not such a pleasant experience to experience God. This is the fearsome aspect of God. Imagine that this is all the energy, the source of all the energy. Some of you may have experienced this. You all have experienced electricity as you're sitting in your rooms right now. You're listening to this. You're looking at your laptops. You're looking at other gadgets. You, none of this modern life would function without electricity. Yet, Few of us have been anywhere close to a power generator. So he is now in the presence of, you can imagine, uh, a room where there's a lot of, you know, high voltage electricity and it can be frightening. Anything you touch could be um, extremely powerful, high voltage, and that kind of power is, is frightening. So while we have seen the benign side of electricity in our lives, we have seen the, the more terrible side of electricity in lightning, for example, which is not really controlled. It is very powerful, very concentrated, and it can strike anywhere. And so, we are talking about coming face to face with raw energy itself. Can you imagine looking at electricity? 
this is what happens when the kundalini rises and that experience is initially not a pleasant one it is not a um, mild um, gentle thing it is very powerful it can shock the system if you imagine yourself to be a bulb you know a bulb has to be of a certain voltage if you try to put a 12 voltage bulb in a 120 volt fixture what's going to happen to the bulb the bulb is going to be destroyed it's going to just fuse so we need to prepare our bodies and our minds for such kind of high power voltage. Arjuna has just got a glimpse because more than that he cannot take. It's simply too much energy. And when that energy, which is so powerful, is experienced like this in this raw form, it is fearsome. It is it is very frightening. <laughs> um, Shibu asked, uh, Arjun still not reached uh, Advaita even after Yoga Darshan. He has attained an insight or a glimpse of that form. But it is not, uh, he is not established in it. This is when you experience it shortly, then the Kundalini falls back down. Because initially, a yogi who is learning Kundalini Yoga is not trained enough to raise the Kundalini and to, to establish it there. It falls because it requires a lot more energy to hold it there than he actually has at that point of time. The entire apparatus, the body, as well as the mind, has to be trained, has to be purified. The obstacles have to be removed. So, yes, um, Arjuna has got a, a glimpse of Advaita, that state of non-dualism, but is not established in it. Okay, any, any more questions about this? Okay then, verses 32 to 34. The Blessed Lord said, I am time waxing, destroyer of the worlds, moving here to gather back the worlds. Even with you, all these will cease to be, the warriors who are standing in each of the armies. Therefore rise and gain reputation, conquering the enemy, enjoy the prosperous kingdom. They are already killed by you, you become merely an instrument, O oh, expert at shooting with the left hand. Drona, Bhishma, Jaldatra, Karna, as well as all the brave warriors, they are already killed by me. Destroy them. Do not suffer hesitation. Fight. You are going to be winner of enemies in the battle. Sri Krishna says, essentially, that these are the forces of time. The march of time is relentless. The law of nature is merciless. Whether you kill them or not, they will die. 
And that is a law that we all know. We are facing death all the time. So, to not become weak, explore your inner self. This is the, the battle we are talking about. This is the war we are talking about. It's not an external battlefield. It's about the inner war of dharma, of righteousness. Learning to go through all this ignorance and find that light within, that, that light of a thousand suns which is inside of you. Seek it out. Why does he call him an expert at shooting with the left hand? He is an archer. Arjun is an archer. And most archers, they can shoot with one hand. But Arjun is ambidextrous. He can shoot with both, with right as well as left. This means a person who is very balanced. It's a balanced, both the left as well as the right sides are balanced. This is very important little clue which has been left there for us. And before the Kundalini can rise, both Ida and Pingala must be balanced, left as well as right. Sun as well as moon must be in balance. When both are balanced, only then can the Kundalini arise. Okay. Any thoughts here? Comments? So this is the next group of verses is also slightly longer and um, they're an interesting group of verses. So I will read. Sanjay said, hearing these words of Keshava, his hands clasped, trembling, wearing a crown, bowing again and again, Arjuna addressed Krishna with a trembling voice. Exceedingly afraid, prostrating, Arjuna said, Aptly, O Lord of senses, by glorifying you, the world rejoices and is attracted with love toward you. The demonic ones are running in all directions, afraid. The multitude of adepts are all bowing to you. Wherefore should they not bow to you? O great souled one, the greatest, the creator even of Brahma in the beginning, endless, lord of the gods, the dwelling place of the world, you the indestructible syllable, existent, non-existent, and whatever is beyond these. You are the first god, the ancient spirit. You are the transcendental repository of this universe. You are the knower, the object of knowledge, and the transcendent abode. O oh, you of endless forms, this universe is spanned and permeated by you. You are Vayu, Yama, Agni, Varun, the moon, the progenitor, and the great grandfather. Salutations, salutations be to you a thousand times and again, and even more, again, salutations, salutations to you, salutations in front of you and behind you, salutations be to you from all sides, O oh all, you of endless power, an immeasurable stride, fill and pervade everything totally, 
therefore you are all. Thinking of you, my friend, whatever I said impetuously, O Krishna, O Yadava, O friend, not knowing this glory of yours, inadvertently, as well as out of affection, as I have been disrespectful, out of jest, in, oc in occasions of sport, sleep or dining, alone in the, or in the presence of others, O infallible one, I beg you, who are immeasurable, to forgive me. You are the father of the moving and unmoving world. You are the honourable, greatest guru. There is no one equal to you. How can anyone excel even in the three worlds, O oh, you of unequalled power? Therefore, bowing with lowered body, I seek your indulgence. You are the sovereign object of praises. Like father to son, like friend to friend, like a dear one to the beloved, O oh God, you must forgive me. Happy at seeing what was never seen before, yet my mind is trembling with fear. Show me, God, the same previous form. Be pleased, O sovereign of God's dwelling place of the worlds. I want to see you the same way as before. Wearing crown, wearing maize, with discus in hand, be of the same four-armed form, O thousand-armed one, whose form is the universe. Beautiful verses, uh, wonderful bhava. Arjuna, experiencing this overwhelming cosmic form, is filled with the bhava of humility or surrender. He feels uh, embarrassed and ashamed that perhaps not having recognized this amazing cosmic form of his, he may have been disrespectful earlier, treating him as a friend. Out of affection, maybe he, he, he was being silly or foolish and in that he may have disrespected him. And so he feels a tremendous sense of humility having seen this form and he apologizes for his previous actions even though they may have been out of ignorance. And that is how it is. We sometimes behave like this in the presence of our teachers or of those deserving respect and honor. Sometimes we behave foolishly out of ignorance. And so he apologizes. At the same time, he says, this amazing power that he is experiencing, you know, he sees all these things in him and he's overwhelmed and he says, I cannot see it anymore. I am happy to have seen what I have not seen before, but my mind is trembling with fear. So let me see your previous pleasant form. He is not able to look upon this form any longer. When the Kundalini rises and we experience within us this cosmic universal self, you cannot hold it for very long. As I said, you are perhaps a 12 watt bulb in a 120 volt fixture. And if you would try to push that further, that would have an irreparable damage. We are talking about deep power and energy that needs to be integrated slowly at first. Only as the body and mind has been purified over a period of time, and you have got used to higher and higher levels of consciousness, are you able to hold this 
Kundalini for a longer period of time and remain established in it. Until that time, you will receive this only in little glimpses. This grace comes in little glimpses. These are wonderful moments, these are privileges, gifts. And if you should get such a gift, cherish it, be grateful for it. These little glimpses will help you to continue on this path until you are established. Without these glimpses, it's like walking in the dark. You, don't, you can't see in the room at all. You're completely in a dark room. But if the light were on for just a split second, in that moment, you are able to look and get an idea of what is where so that you don't fall, so that you don't bump into the furniture. Within those few moments, you're able to see a little in the room that's enough for you to be sure, yes, I'm on the right track. I'm able to find things here now. And then you continue in the dark until you get that next little glimpse of light, which will keep leading you. This is this beautiful chapter about Kundalini. Vishwarupa Darshan Yoga. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, it was nice having you all. I hope to see you all then next year, 2017 on the 27th January. Until then, I wish you all the best. Have a wonderful new year. And um, have a nice time. Enjoy your weekend as well. So, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Yeah. Bye-bye, Matthias. Bye, Manisha. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Millie. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, Kalpana. Should we, you're going to stay in the, in the call? Yeah.